I want to welcome everybody here. We're going to start the first of our series of four introductory classes to Buddhism. And um, I'm going to be covering things. We're going to do some meditation each week and, you know, get you going on some meditation and then talk about some of the basic um, principles of Buddhism. But the way I'm going to explain them is very much in terms of practice and in terms of relevancy to our daily life. Okay, so this isn't an academic course. It's one um, that's very practical and personal and relating to our own life experience. So it's within that context and that kind of framework that, that we're going to um, talk these next four weeks. Okay, so let's start out with some meditation. Yeah. So um, before we meditate, let me just explain what it is. Um, <laughs> Because there's a lot of misunderstanding about what a meditation is nowadays in America. As soon as something goes into Time magazine, you know that uh, <laughs> that there's probably going to be some misconceptions. Okay, so meditation doesn't mean daydreaming, doesn't mean spacing out, it doesn't mean just relaxing so that you feel better. Yeah, it doesn't mean visualizing yourself with the best boyfriend on the best beach with the best car, okay? <laughs> um, but the Tibetan word for meditation is gom. And gom is the, it comes from the verbal root to, uh, root to habituate or familiarize. So the idea is that a meditation is to familiarize or habituate ourselves with positive ways of thinking, with virtuous ways of looking at the world, okay? So that involves discerning uh, in our own mind what is constructive and realistic and what is not, and then being able to enhance the positive aspects of our own mind and our own character and uh, habituate ourselves with those. Okay? Now there's two different kinds of meditation. One is called stabilizing meditation, and this is to help us develop concentration and to calm the mind down and learn to focus it a bit. And the second kind of meditation is um, called checking or analytic or scrutinizing meditation. And the purpose of this is to develop understanding, okay, to really learn to understand our lives, understand the world. So the first kind of meditation we're going to learn here tonight is uh, one of the, the first kinds, one of the stabilizing meditations to develop concentration. And I think that's good for us as Americans because we have very busy lives and we're running around and our lives are full of so much stuff. And we, know that we need to learn to stabilize our mind and calm, calm it down a bit. Because until we do that, everything else just kind of goes right by us. Okay? So, um, as the object of the meditation that we're going to do tonight, we're going to use the breath. Yeah, so uh, breath is very very good object for meditation because it um, everybody is breathing I hope um, <laughs> if you're not breathing you're gonna have a little trouble doing this meditation um, <laughs> and uh, I mean for people who have allergies or who has have asthma or something like that as time goes on I'll, sh I'll teach another kind you know if the breathing doesn't feel completely comfortable with you but for most people you know the, the you know, to start with, the breathing works well. And it's also something that's totally non-denominational, so you don't need to be a Buddhist. Yeah. And uh, it's something that's going on all the time. So using the breath as our object of meditation means that whenever we kind of remember during the day, we can come back to our breath because it's always there. Okay. So as for your posture for meditation, it's good to sit in the cross-legged position, if you can. Um, <laughs> if you, you know, like sitting like a pretzel. If, um, if the pretzel position doesn't fit you, that's perfectly all right. You can sit in a chair. It's good if you're sitting cross-legged to have a cushion under your rear so that your rear is higher. It prevents your legs from falling asleep. And you might have to experiment as time goes on with the size and shape and hardness and softness of your cushion because that varies a lot. Okay, and you want to keep your back straight 
and then your hands, the right on the left and the thumbs are touching to form a triangle and this is placed in your lap against your body. Okay, so it's a relaxed thing. Don't, don't hold your arms up like this and don't slouch them to out like this. Just kind of natural in your lap like that. Okay, so, so that there naturally happens to be a little bit of space between your body and, uh, and your arm. Hmm? And then your head is level. Okay, you don't want your head drooping because it usually continues. <laughs> and you don't want it tilted up because that's going to cause a lot of distraction. So you want your head kind of level. You might tuck your chin in a little bit. And then lower your eyes. Um, they always say that it's good to keep your eyes a little bit open because that prevents distraction. And, but you're not really looking at anything. So your eyes are just kind of down here in the space in front. But you're not really paying attention to what you're seeing because when we're meditating, we're working more with our mental consciousness, not with our visual consciousness. Okay, so you're sitting up straight, and the eyes are lowered. And then I'll lead you through a little bit of a body scan to relax the body, and then kind of introduce you to the breathing meditation. And then we'll have some moments of silence uh, during which you can do it. So first begin by feeling yourself sitting here on the cushion. So bring your attention, bring your mind to where your body is. Be aware of your body sitting here. And be aware also of sitting in a room with like-minded people who have the same interest and curiosity about a spiritual path that you do. And we'll do a little body scan to let go of tension in our body. So become aware of your legs and your feet, the sensations in them. <clears throat> and if there's any tightness, let that go. So the breath is what's happening now. We want to bring our attention to what's going on right now. And be aware of how incredible it is simply to breathe. Let's do that quietly now. For a moment or two, let's generate our motivation and think that we're here to learn, to improve ourselves, to recognize and let go of our faults, and to recognize and enhance our good qualities. And we're going to do this not only for our own well-being, but we live in a world where we're completely interdependent with other living beings. And so the more we're able to develop wisdom and compassion and clarity within ourselves, the more we're going to be able to contribute in a positive way for the welfare of others. And so making that positive contribution in the long term and in the short term for the well-being of all living beings
That's our basic motivation. And slowly come out of your meditation. <clears throat> so the cultivation of our motivation is actually quite important. Now, from a Buddhist viewpoint, why we do something is actually more important than what we do. And we're usually, you know, not so aware of why we're doing what we're doing. So it's good to take some time at the beginning and just reflect, you know, why am I here? What am I doing? And why am I doing it? And to try and cultivate an attitude um, of loving kindness and compassion towards others and bring that into what we're doing in the present moment. Okay. So that I'm not just kind of getting up in the morning and going through the day and doing this and that and the other thing simply because I want to be happy and I want to be I want to have pleasure. But, you know, we live in a world where, you know, everything we have comes from others. Now how can we just kind of go through our life just, you know, my pleasure, my happiness, when everything we have depends on others? So it's very good to cultivate that awareness at the beginning of the day on how we're all interrelated and make that part of our motivation, you know. Since we're interrelated, as much as I can refrain from harming others, as much as I can develop a kind heart, that much more in all my interactions from simple ones to complex ones with others, I'm going to be able to give something beneficial to them. Okay, so we cultivate that motivation at the beginning. So, I thought I'd just begin a little bit by introducing the center, because uh, some of you may never have been in a Buddhist center, and may wonder what all this stuff is. <laughs> <clears throat> so we have a Buddhist statue in the, in the center, and the reason we have a statue is because it reminds us of our own potential. Okay, because um, if you look at the the Buddha, he's sitting kind of serenely, isn't he? He doesn't look like your boss when your boss is mad. <laughs> he doesn't look like us when we're fed up with our kids. The Buddha's just sitting there, just being, you know, with a kind of a, an acceptance and a peacefulness and a, you know, not isolating, his eyes are open looking at us. And so whenever we pass a figure or a picture of the Buddha, it reminds us that we have that potential to be serene and open and understanding and compassionate ourselves. So we have the image of the Buddha there to remind us you know, that we have that potential inside. And then we have various other pictures of various Buddhist, um, different Buddhas, Buddha of Compassion over there and over here, the Buddha of Wisdom over on this side. We have various offerings set up. The reason that we set up offerings of fruit and flowers and water uh, is not because the Buddhas need those, okay? When you're a Buddha, you don't need somebody to give you presents in order to be happy. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but the purpose of having the offerings there is so that we develop an attitude of generosity, okay? So that we uh, habituate our mind in thinking, what can I give? What can I offer? Because mostly in our life, we're thinking, what can I get? And everywhere we go, it's, what can I get out of this? What can I receive? What can I buy? What can I consume? And the whole idea of making offerings is to reverse that to what can I give? Okay, so we give here, we give to each other, you know, we give to the people we encounter in our life. 
Okay. Uh, here we have the, uh, in all the yellow book covers, we have the Tibetan texts, which uh, are the Buddha's word and the major Indian commentaries. It's called the Kangyur and the Tengyur. So there's a, those are all Tibetan texts within there. Uh, which we were actually quite fortunate to get for the center. And it's quite auspicious to have them, because uh, it contains all the major teachings that the Buddha gave and the major commentaries on them. And then just a little bit about my own background. Um, and the reason I'm telling you all of this is so, th so that you'll know something about the environment you're in, and so that you're, you'll recognize that um, what you're going to be learning isn't something that was made up yesterday. Okay, so um, the the Buddha lived in India, ancient India, in the sixth century uh, B.C. He taught there, and from there his teachings were spread throughout India, down into Sri Lanka, into Southeast Asia. They spread north into Tibet, into China. Uh, around Korea and Japan, okay? So the teachings spread quite uh, rapidly all throughout Asia. And then in the recent centuries, uh, they began to come to the West. And so DFF is, is um, a Dharma center that follows the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. So uh, the Tibetans, those of you who've seen seven years in Tibet or Kundun, know a little bit about it, um, in 1959, there was an abortive uprising against the Chinese occupation of Tibet. And so the Dalai Lama and many of the teachers and other people fled the country into India at that time. And after 1959, then Tibetan Buddhism slowly began to become... Mm, people in the West be began to know about it. You know, before that, Tibet was pretty closed. It was hard to learn. So uh, I began to, to learn about Tibetan Buddhism in 1975. I went to a meditation course taught by two Tibetan monks, uh, Lama Yeshe and Lama Zopa. Mm -hmm. Lama Yeshe, some of you may have, have heard about. After he passed away, he was uh, reborn as a Spanish child. Some of you may have read the book called The Boy Lama, which is about him. So Lama was my first teacher, and then Zopa Rinpoche. And uh, so I studied with them in Nepal for a while, and also in India in Dharamsala, which is the uh, home of the Tibetan government in exile. And so uh, they also referred me to other teachers to study with. And so my three major teachers, um, my other major teachers besides Sopa Rinpoche are also His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Senshub Sirka Rinpoche. And like I said, I tell you this so, so that you'll know that what you're learning is something that's coming, you know, through the best of my limited abil ability, through an actual tradition, okay? So I'm, I'm not making up something. Um, and I'm not trying to embellish it and revise it so that it is, uh, you know, more popular in the American consumer market. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just trying to pass on to you what my teachers have taught me because it's something that I found beneficial. So I started uh, learning about Buddhism in 1975, and then after a while decided that I wanted to ordain as a nun. This, of course, was my own decision. And um, basically, because I wanted to devote my whole life to my spiritual practice, so it's not required, you know. You, we don't have a hidden um, uh, hair clippers so up in the corner, you know. <laughs> I'm going to get you all before you leave class. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> okay. But personally speaking, you know, living as an, as an ordained person is something I've found very helpful for my practice. So I, I lived the early years in Asia, training in the Tibetan community, and then when my teachers uh, were asked to open centers in other countries, then they asked some of their older students to go and help in those centers. So I wound up living in Italy and in France and in Singapore and Hong Kong and various other places. 
and then several years ago came back to the States and, you know, wound up in Seattle. Much to my own surprise, it was not pre-planned. Um, but I've been here now for six years with Dharma Friendship Foundation. Okay, so that's just a little bit about my background. Um, as as we talk these next four weeks, we're gonna you're gonna hear the word mind a lot. So I think I better define it at the beginning, because mind is. It's an English word that we're trying to use to translate a Buddhist concept, but the English word isn't a complete, isn't a totally accurate translation. So I just want to let you know that when I use this word, what I'm referring to, okay? So from a Buddhist viewpoint, we have our body and then we have our mind or our consciousness. Yeah? Our body is something atomic and molecular. And our body includes our brain, okay? But our brain is not our mind. Yeah, the brain is, is atomic. The mind is consciousness, it's awareness. It's that part of us that feels and thinks and experiences. And when I say mind, it doesn't just mean intellect, but it also means emotions, it means perceptions including, you know, what is it that perceives color and shape? What is it that hears sounds? What is it that feels things? So when I say mind, it's referring to all these conscious parts of us. Yeah? So we have sense consciousnesses that enable us to know the sense world. We also have a mental consciousness that thinks and feels and various things go on. So when I say the word mind, it includes that whole spectrum of conscious awareness. Mm -hmm. So one of the, the foremost things that the Buddha pointed out was that the source of our happiness and suffering basically lies <coughs> within our own mind, within our own consciousness. And this is kind of the opposite to how we usually think of things, okay? Because our usual way of thinking thing, of things is that happiness and suffering exist outside of us, okay? I'm just sitting here, and I need this thing to be happy. I need my chocolate to be happy, yeah? I need my clothes to be happy, I need my boyfriend to be happy, I need my career to be happy, I need certain people near me to be happy, I need my sports equipment to be happy, I need my vacations to be happy. I sound like a good American consumer, don't I? <laughs> okay, good for the economy. So I, I need all these things out here, and I want to draw them into myself so that I can be happy. And that's basically how we go through our lives, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, when we wake up in the morning, kind of what's our first thought? You know, where's my coffee? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> Something outside. There's happiness in that cup of Starbucks. I need it to be happy. Okay. So from the beginning of the day to the end, we're always looking outside for other things and people and ideas and circumstances and places and whatever that we can gather to us to bring ourselves happiness. That's our ordinary view. And similarly, in our ordinary view, we think that the cause of our problems lies outside. Yeah. Why do I have problems? Well, my boss is a jerk. Yeah. And the people underneath me don't cooperate. And my mother and father did this and that when I was three and four years old, so I'm so screwed up. And, you know, my husband or my wife does this, and my kids don't listen to me, and my parents hang up on me, and even my dog, you know, doesn't pay attention. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, and so, why do I have problems? Well, because everything else around me isn't good enough. You know? So then we have advice for everyone and everything around us on how they should improve and change. 
because if they change, then we would be happy. So we have advice for every, whoever you live with, we have advice, don't we, how they can change, just a little bit, how they can improve, you know, <laughs> what they can do. And we have advice for our kids and advice for our parents, advice for our boss, advice for our employees, lots of advice for the president. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> lots, lots of advice for all the political leaders in the world. We have so much advice to give everybody, and we feel like if only everybody would listen to our sage advice and put it into practice, then finally we would be happy. It's kind of the way we feel, don't we? You know, if only, other, if only the things outside me would change, then they'd stop causing me problems. And so we go through our life trying to change everything that's outside of us, trying to rearrange everything. Everything that we find unpleasant, we push away. Yeah? Or we strike back at it. Or we run away from it. Or we try and change it. Yeah? And this whole world view of happiness and suffering lying outside of us puts us in a very difficult position because we're constantly trying to make the world and our surroundings be what we want it to be and we never succeed. We never have enough money, do we? We're always trying to get more. Does anybody here have enough money? Does Bill Gates have enough money? No, he wants to make more. He doesn't feel financially secure either. <laughs> no? He has the same mentality as, as we do. Okay? So this thing of, you know, wanting to get things out from outside, wanting to push away things outside, leaves us in a very difficult position because we can't control everything around us. We try to. We give everybody we know all of our wonderful advice on how they should improve and change. And what do they say to us? <laughs> when they're polite, they say, please mind your own business. <laughs> you know? <laughs> of course, what do we say when they tell us all their wonderful advice on how we should change so that they could be happy? We don't listen, do we? So this view of trying to change everything outside of us so that we can be happy puts us in a dead end because it makes us always fighting against the world fighting trying to change everything never satisfied with the circumstances we're in and that's difficult isn't it i mean that's kind of the story of our lives and what the buddha said was, well, okay, it looks that, like happiness and suffering come from outside. But check your own experience and see if that's really the case. So we start to look at our own experience. So something that, that comes so vividly to mind about this is uh, days when we wake up and we're in a bad mood. Nothing's happened. We've all had that experience, haven't we? Nothing's happened. You wake up, you're in a lousy mood. You get up, you go to work, you know, or you, you go do whatever you're doing. And have you ever noticed that the days when you're in a bad mood, that you meet so many rude, obnoxious people? Yeah, they all turn up that day. Don't they? Days when we're in a good mood, when we feel confident, even we get some negative feedback, we don't get bent out of shape, we just kind of go on. But days when we're in a bad mood, even somebody says hello to us, they have an ulterior motive. What's going on? They don't always say hello to me like this. There's something behind it. Yeah? And we can watch in our own lives, can't we? So just through this kind of ordinary day-to-day uh, -day experience, we can see how much our own mind, our own perception, our own way of looking at things creates what we experience. So even though we feel like we're going through life encountering some kind of objective world out there, 
with all these objective things in it. In actual fact, when we look at our experience, we are very actively engaged in creating what it is by what we bring to it. Because things don't exist independent of our mind. Now, we describe something to ourselves in a certain way and then we experience it in the way that we describe it to ourselves. Excuse me, could you repeat that? That's important. Okay. We describe the world to ourselves in a certain way and then we experience it as we've described it to ourselves. Okay? So, for example, we could come in here tonight and we could say, Oh, this room's so hot. It's so crowded. Yeah, I'm really uncomfortable. What's all this stuff going on? I don't like it here. Yeah, and then we really don't like it because we're focusing on it's hot and it's crowded. You know, this lady just talks and talks and talks and she doesn't realize how, how my back hurts and my knees hurt, you know. <laughs> and then we really get in a bad mood. Or we could come in here and say, wow, you know, there's something really interesting here. And there's a bunch of really nice people. It's kind of a pretty place, lots of colors. And then we feel really happy being here. Okay. So how we describe something to ourselves determines how we experience it. I mean, we could walk in, the, like the room here, you know. Probably most of you don't know most of the people here. I don't know most of you. You know, we can walk into a room full of strangers, and our whole take on the situation is, these are all strangers. Who's going to like me? Am I going to fit in? <laughs> you know? And we're kind of like a little nervous and antsy coming into this room where we don't know anybody. What are they going to think about me? Or we can walk into the room and think, wow, here's all these nice people. I wonder who I can make friends with. I wonder what I can give to all these people here. And according to how we think when we walk in the room, we experience the whole environment like that. So we either experience it as full of all these strangers, who are, of course, paying so much attention to us and deciding whether they like us or not. They don't have anything better to think about. You know? <laughs> but they're all looking at me, and do they like me? You know? uh, we either experience it like that, or we experience it like, wow, you know, here are all these people. Who can I talk to? There's got to be a lot of interesting people here. You know, I have some happiness inside me. I wonder who I can talk to and share my happiness with. And if we, you know, come into the room like that, then we experience the people as being very friendly and it being a nice place. Okay. The room is exactly the same, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But how we experience it depends on our own attitude, how we describe the situation to ourselves. So, there's so many ways to look at our life and understand how this operates. And what this does is it gives us the ability to transform our own experiences. Because if things were objective out entities out there, then there, and we were perceiving them completely accurately and they were independent of our mind, then there would be no possible way to change our experience we would be totally stuck. But because our mind is helping to create our experience, it means if we change our mind, if we change our attitude, our experience changes. Yeah. So that is actually very much what Buddhist practice is about. It's about changing our mind, changing how we look at things. In fact, there's even one passage in the scriptures where it's uh, <coughs> talking about, you know, people we don't like and making an analogy that we can either um, cover the world in asphalt or we can put on a pair of shoes. 
So we can either, you know, try and destroy everybody we don't like, or we could change our own mind. Yeah? Reasonable alternative, huh? <laughs> but, I mean, most of what the world tries to do is destroy what we don't like. So then we have so much conflict between people, between ethnic groups, between countries, and so on and so forth. If we try and transform our own mind, then there's the opportunity, there's the possibility to actually feel in sync and feel, in, feel connected uh, to whoever meet, we meet wherever we are. Okay. So the fact that our mind helps to create our experience gives us a lot of power in our life to change our mind. It also gives us a lot of responsibility because what it means is that we can't go through our life blaming everybody else and everything outside of us anymore. And we're kind of in the habit of doing that, aren't we? You know, as a culture, American culture, we, we, we've kind of perfected um, the perfection of blaming everybody else. <laughs> I mean, media. What does media do? Yeah. And what do we do in our pop psychology and our self-help groups? A lot of it, you know, we blame our family. We blame our upbringing. Okay. In Buddhism, it's not a question of blaming. Yeah? We don't want to talk about blaming. What we want to talk about is, how can I transform what's going on in here so that everything I experience becomes something beneficial for my own spiritual growth? And by enabling me to grow inside, then what can I give back to the world? Okay. So Buddhist practice is very much about discriminating what attitudes and emotions in our own mind are realistic and beneficial and which ones are unrealistic and not beneficial. So we have to learn to discriminate those. And then we learn the antidotes to apply to subdue the ones that are unrealistic and not beneficial. And we learn the techniques to apply to increase the realistic and beneficial aspects of ourselves. That's basically what Buddhist practice is. Yeah? And that's why many people don't see Buddhism as a religion, per se, but maybe as a way of life, as a philosophy, as a psychology, as all of the above. Okay? So it's not something to believe in. It's something to do. And it's not something to do by fixing everything outside. It's something to do by becoming our own friend, looking at what's going on in here. And how often in our life do we take time to be quiet and be alone and to get in touch with what's going on inside? We don't take much time for that, do we? We keep ourselves incredibly busy. And again, we think the busyness is coming from outside. Yeah. Look at my calendar. It's all my appointments. It's my calendar is so filled. I have no time. The world is impinging on me. I have all these things to do. But of course, the moment we have a free half an hour, we don't know what to do and we freak out. We call somebody else and schedule something right away. <laughs> yeah? It's so hard for us just to learn to be. You know, and to be quiet and not always feel like we need something outside to entertain ourselves and amuse ourselves. Because all that sense stimu stimulation that we seek outside actually creates a lot of the restless energy and the stress that we suffer from so much. Okay, so in some ways I think we have to wean ourselves yeah, away from the television and the radio and the CD and the morning paper and the magazines and learn to, instead of looking outside and forming so many opinions about what everybody else and everything else is doing outside, take some time and say, what's going on inside of me? What am I feeling? All these opinions that I have about other things, where are these opinions coming from? 
Are my opinions reliable and accurate? Or do my opinions just tie me up in knots and maybe they aren't all so necessary? Okay. So it's a lot taking the time to really see what's happening in here. And that's why His Holiness Dalai Lama says our best laboratory is in here. Yeah. We don't need to experiment with, with mice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we need just to sit and look at what's going on inside of here. Okay, so what do we see when we look and we start, we start looking going on inside of here? Okay, well this example when we just tried to do the breathing meditation, could anybody focus on the breath without any distractions? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty hard, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, so we have two major things going on, you know. We sit there, we come with really good intentions. I'm going to just be in the present moment aware of the breath. So we get through two breaths, and then it's like, oh, I heard the door open. I wonder who that is. I think I'll look. <laughs> I hope nobody else is seeing me. Ooh, maybe that's that person I know. Oh, no, it's not the person I know, but they really look like somebody else I know. And I I remember, yeah, I knew that person. We met five years ago at this incredible party, and I was going out with this other person at that party, but now he's moved away, and I don't know where he is anymore. And they sold that house, and that was a fantastic house. Gee, I really like that house. I wonder how, how long is it going to take me to save enough money to buy a house like that? Let's see. Should I put my money in an IRA? Should I take it out of the stock? <laughs> uh, and then, oh yeah, I was supposed to be paying attention to the breath. <laughs> yeah, it's like that, isn't it? You know, free association. That's what we call mental distraction. <laughs> and we'll notice that a lot of our mental distraction revolves around things that we're attached to. Okay? So by attachment, Okay, I'm referring to attachment in a very specific way here. Attachment is an attitude within ourself in which we exaggerate the good qualities of someone or something, and then because we've painted this great picture, then we need it. We have to have it. We can't live without it. And attachment is very deceptive because when our mind, when attachment arises in our mind, it puts this filter and we're sure things outside are really as wonderful as we perceive them to be. So this house that I thought of in my meditation is really a good one. <laughs> and it's really going to make me happy if I have it. Definitely. I mean, if I have it, then, you know, my brother's going to know that I make a lot of money, and my parents are going to know I'm successful, and I'll live in this house, and I'll have this, and I'll have that, and the other thing. And we create this whole fantasy. Okay? Now, most of you live in houses or apartments. Do you live happily ever after? No, the plumbing breaks. The, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the sewage doesn't work. The roof leaks. Yeah. So we dream of this house that we've got to have to be to live happily ever after. But is that our experience that when we get what we dream of, that we that it makes us totally happy? No. Our experience is it brings a lot of headaches. Yeah. Before you had the house, you didn't have to worry about the plumber and the electrician and the gardener and all this other kind of stuff. Okay. So what attachment does is it looks at things in a certain way and paints this beautiful picture that makes us feel, if I only had this, I'll be happy. Okay. So this is also the mind that fuels our major American addiction, shopping. You think shopping's our major American addiction? Yeah. I think we have more uncontrolled shoppers than we do alcoholics. <laughs> Can you be a shopaholic? I mean, what do we do when we feel depressed, when we feel like ill at ease? What do we do? We go out and we buy something. Yeah, we go to the grocery store, we go to the... We go, we buy something, okay? 
because if I get that thing, it's going to make me happy. Are you happy yet? You wouldn't be here if you were, <laughs> you know? I mean, really, if all of our possessions made us happy, we'd be at home living it up with all of our possessions. <laughs> But we keep buying one thing after another because the mind of attachment says, this is going to be the thing that's really going to make me happy. And we keep getting let down. Okay. We're kind of like the rats. You know, the, the rats, they, they give like one grain and the rat pecks and then it keeps pecking, you know, like a hundred times. It doesn't get any grain and then maybe it gets another one. So then it keeps pecking. Kind of, so kind of like you know, rats with the grain or people at Vegas, you know, with the slot machine. <laughs> you know, next time, I'm sure, I'm going to get it. Well, we're kind of like that in terms of seeking external things that are going to make us happy. But our very own experience is that it doesn't lead to satisfaction. That that mind of attachment that creates this big picture of if only I had this, I'm going to be happy, that isn't, it doesn't lead to that. So that's why we say attachment is a disturbing attitude. Disturbs our mind, doesn't it? It makes our mind restless. It makes us feel poor. When we have attachment, we never have enough. We have to get something more. Okay. So the mind of attachment leads to dissatisfaction. And you look, in this country, we are the richest country in the world, but I think in many ways we suffer from the most dissatisfaction. So much dissatisfaction. We never have enough. And we're never good enough, are we? Yeah. I mean, do we, do we ever feel like we've really kind of made it in our life? No, I've never made it. You know, I have to get this degree, and then I have to get that degree, and I have to win this, and I have to win that, and I have to be best here, and I have to get the promotion, and I have to be recognized, and I have to have this one tell me they love me, and that one respect me, and this one appreciate me. And we're always looking for others' approval and, you know, a good reputation. And, you know, we're looking for strokes, aren't we? And we never get enough. We never get enough, do we? Do we ever feel that we have enough love? We spend a lot of time feeling that we don't have enough love. I don't think we spend nearly as much time wondering if we give enough love. Okay? This is how attachment works. Attachment makes us worry more about, am I loved enough? Okay, attachment is, is centers on the self. Am I getting enough love? And as soon as we start thinking, am I getting enough love? As soon as that thought enters the mind, the automatic answer is no. Because there always could be somebody else who loved or respected or appreciated or approved of me more. Okay. If we're able to let go of the attachment, and instead of focusing on, am I getting enough, focus instead on, can I give enough, you know, who do I love, do I love other people, you know, how can I open my heart to love other people more, when we focus more on that, then automatically something within ourselves is quite satisfied, isn't it? Yeah. When, when, whenever we focus on the self, there's always this feeling of insufficiency. I'm not good enough. Okay, because we're always trying to compete with some kind of impossible ideal that doesn't even exist. But as soon as we let go of that ideal, and we stop competing with the kid across the street, and we start thinking, how can I give more? Or in the case of our material possessions, who can I give to? No. Or who can I praise? Do we ever get up in the morning and think, who can I praise today? Who can I say kind things to today? Who can I say kind things about today? You know, how often do we start the day off thinking that? We usually start the day off with, you know, 
who's going to say kind things about me? Or rather, who's going to say mass, nasty, mean things about me and I'm going to have to defend myself? Okay, so if we start the day off with, you know, who's going to say nasty, mean things about me, then we're looking for that all day, aren't we? We're on the lookout for everybody who's going to say nasty things to or about me. And for sure we're going to see them. Whether anybody from their side or not is saying them, we're going to perceive that they are. You know, if we change the mind and we start with a thing of today, who can I say nice, nice things to? Who can I praise? Who can I say nice things, nice things about? Who can I give my love and affection to? And we approach our life with that, we're going to feel very rich inside. So again, you see how it's not the thing of changing the world. The thing is changing our attitude. Okay. So the, atta the attitude of attachment exaggerates the good qualities and clings to them, creating dissatisfaction. The attitude of anger or aversion does the opposite. It exaggerates the bad qualities of someone or something or projects bad qualities and then because we can't stand something, we want to push it away. We want to destroy it, you know, strike back at it or get away from it. And so, you know, we go through our lives with this kind of yo-yo mind of, oh, I like this, I want it. Ooh, I can't stand that, get away. Yeah? And both of those attitudes are focused on me. What's going to make me happy? What's going to bring me problems? And the mind starts making stories about everything we encounter. And that creates a lot of suffering for us. Because with attachment, we elaborate on the good qualities, and then we feel poor because we don't have something. With anger, we elaborate on the bad qualities, and then we feel horrible. You know, we feel like the whole world is against us. And when we have anger, we find things th that make us unpleasant, that, that seem unpleasant to us. Okay? You know, as long as we have anger in our mind, we're going to find somebody to hate. As long as we have anger, we're going to find someone to hate. We're going to find something that's disagreeable. Because our own mind is just all set and prepared for it. Yeah? And like I was saying before, you know, if we have a restless, angry mind, we walk into a situation and somebody says, hello, good morning, then we're suspicious. They don't always say good morning to me like that. They want something out of me. Yeah? Or somebody comes and praises us. Oh, you did a really good job on this project. Or, oh, you look really nice. They don't really mean that. They're just manipulating me. I know it. Yeah. Whenever we have anger, we're going to find something to pick at. Okay. Uh, I always like to tell the, the, the peanut butter story to show how anger works. Okay, peanut butter story. Okay, so you're married to somebody. And you know how in a marriage you all have your own little jobs and something, you know, that you, do, you both take care of things around the house. And so one morning you wake up and you like peanut butter with your toast in the morning and there's no peanut butter in the refrigerator. And you look at your husband and you say, there's no peanut butter in the refrigerator. Why isn't there peanut butter in the refrigerator? It's your job, honey, to get peanut butter. <laughs> This isn't, this, something's wrong. You know, you didn't just forget the peanut butter. This is planned, because you know that I like peanut butter. Something's wrong. I know this. I mean, this is really indicative of our whole marriage. <laughs> because you're always doing these passive-aggressive things. <laughs> always. I mean, this is classic passive-aggressive. You know, because you know I like peanut butter, and there's no peanut butter. There's something going on. And why don't you open up and tell me what it is? 
Yeah, you never talk to me. You just hold things in and you act in this ridiculous way. Why did I marry you to start with? <laughs> you know, this whole relationship is falling apart. Have you ever had that kind of conversation? <laughs> <laughs> we have, haven't we, you know? Suddenly, the jar of peanut butter is symbolic of the state of the marriage. Why? Not because of the peanut butter, not because of our spouse, but because of the anger in our own mind. Okay? When we have anger, when we have mistrust, we see something outside that validates it. And we create that. And then, of course, you know, we start this, you know, this whole thing. And then, of course, what does our spouse do back? Well, we all know how that one goes, too. <laughs> okay? So, when we look at our own experience, we can see very clearly that attachment destroys our happiness. It makes us always feel poor. It makes us always feel needy and dissatisfied. And anger also destroys our happiness because it makes us suspicious and fearful and, and project negative things on other people. Okay? So, in Buddhism, when we talk about the cause of our suffering, there's something called the three poisonous attitudes. Attachment and anger are two of them. You can see. You know? The third one is called ignorance. And ignorance doesn't, it, it isn't the ignorance of not knowing your timetables, okay? Or the ignorance of not knowing how to, you know, use the latest version of Windows. It's, it's the ignorance of um, misperceiving things. The ignorance with which we concretize everything in our own life. And make everything very concrete. Okay? It's a misapprehension of the world. And through that misapprehension, of how we apprehend the world and how we apprehend ourselves. We don't even apprehend ourselves correctly. We make ourselves into some kind of concrete entity. Yeah? And we're chock-a-bock full of, of self-images, aren't we? Aren't we? Oh, yeah, aren't we full of self-images? I am this nationality. I am this racial group. I am this religious group, I am this weight, I am this age, I am this sexual orientation, I am this gender, I am this socioeconomic class, I am this educational ability, I am this profession. We're chock-a-block full of identities. And yet we're still trying to find out who we are. <laughs> and I always tell you, in Buddhism you have to relax. In Buddhism you're not trying to find out who you are, you're trying to find out who you aren't. And this is a very important thing, because we have a lot of self-images about who we are, and those self-images cause us an incredible amount of pain and suffering. And they're basically ignorant self-images that, that block us into some kind of concrete role. Or we, we put this hat on and we think, this is all I can be. My whole potential in life is, is, is this, you know? And we box ourselves in with our own conceptual mind. And so all of our self-images, yeah, I'm not good looking enough, I'm not rich enough, I'm not intelligent enough, I'm not patient enough, I'm not kind enough. Yeah. I'm not this enough, I'm not that enough. I have so many problems, nobody can relate to me, nobody can love me, I can't love anybody else. I'm so screwed up, I'm addicted, I'm dysfunctional, I'm a, co I'm a codependent. What's the latest one? Compulsive. I, what? Compulsive, obsessive. Yeah, oh, I'm, yeah, compulsive, obsessive, I'm <laughs> passive aggressive, I'm, you know. I mean, it was amazing, because I was out of the country for a long time. I came back, and it's like I had to learn to speak English again. <laughs> I remember I was giving a, a talk, and somebody raised their hand and said, I come from a codependent dysfunctional family, and how can Buddhism help me? And I said, <laughs> huh? <laughs> I didn't know what he meant, you know, because I, I was living in Asia for so long. So, you know... <laughs> But we're all full of these identities, aren't we? All these labels we put on top of ourselves. 
Yeah, and then we think that's who we are, and that's all we ever can be, and that's our essence. And that's what ignorance is. Ignorance is that conceptual mind that misapprehends who we are and makes ourselves into some concrete, usually inferior quality thing. Okay. And so ignorance is one of the three poisonous attitudes that also we're trying to let go of because it causes suffering in our lives and it makes us do things that cause suffering in others' lives. Okay. So the whole point is that what we need to do is become friends with ourselves, uh, look at our own mind, understand our own processes, be aware of what we're saying and thinking and feeling and doing, and begin some process of evaluation of, you know, is what I'm thinking and, and, and feeling realistic? Is it beneficial? Is what I'm doing something beneficial? And slowing down and evaluating and getting to know ourselves. And then finding ways to transform the things that we need, that we feel we need to transform. Let's open it up for questions and maybe some answers. Uh huh. How do you plan to teach this in four weeks? <laughs> <laughs> How do I plan to teach this in four weeks? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. What I plan to do is is try and give you. Um, hit the major points in the path to enlightenment and show you how those apply to your life in order to give you a little bit of a taste and, and then for those of you who want to, you know, you can continue on after that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It seems that uh, attachment, anger, and ignorance um, are perpetual, that, that they occur uh, often even in subtle forms, mm -hmm. sometimes not subtle at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm wondering, is it recommended to sidestep, move through, uh, move away from? I'm grappling with some anger myself mm -hmm. and, and haven't really allowed it a lot in my life. Mm -hmm. But I think I avoided it. Mm. rather than moved through it. And, and I'm trying to understand what Buddhism might say about how to work with these poisonous entities. Okay, so how to work with the attachment, anger, and ignorance in, in your life. And so you're asking specifically, let's say, about anger, how to work with it. Um, I'll just give you a little bit here. If, if you want more in the book, What Color Is Your Mind? There's a whole chapter about anger at the end. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I think we got that on the table. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness, uh, okay. Okay. So with anger, um, before we can deal with anger, we have to learn to recognize it, okay? So working with anger and developing patience isn't a question of pretending we're not angry, and it's not a thing of stuffing the anger in and painting a nice sweet smile on our face, because if we stuff the anger in, it's still there, we're still angry. So we have to recognize that we're angry. And so sometimes we do it by just tuning into our body. Sometimes we can see anger coming. You know, our stomach starts to get tight. Our, our, you know, our heart starts to beat or we could feel, you know, our veins or we start to get flushed. So sometimes just by being aware of our body, we can be aware of our anger. And that's the first thing, just to be aware of the anger. And then uh, there's a few different ways to handle it. Yeah. Um, 
One thing, one way that's quite interesting to handle the anger is to sit down and just feel what the anger feels like in your body. And that's actually quite hard to do because when we're angry, we usually get very involved in a story. <laughs> And when we're angry, our mind is writing this incredible theatrical production <laughs> about how they did me harm, <laughs> starring me, of course. <laughs> yeah. And when we're angry, there's this incredible stream of thoughts going on. And you'll notice it sometimes, because even you'll be sitting in meditation. You know, we're sitting here, nice, peaceful, calm room. You think of the person, what they did to you 10 years ago. And you get raving mad. And then the bell rings and you go, oh, you're not even here. And this happened 10 years ago. But like, you know, you were just furious. Well, when that happens, you can really see how the anger is not created by the external environment. Because you can get angry sitting in a very safe, calm, peaceful place. The anger's not created by the external environment. The anger's created by how I'm thinking. Okay? So then there's a few different way, places we can go from there. <coughs> One thing that's very interesting is when we're angry to say, what are my buttons that are getting pushed? Okay, this person did this and this and this and this, but why am I angry about it? And then our mind keeps repeating, they did da 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 Yes, I know mind, but that's, that's not the point. The point is, why am I angry? Well, they did blah, 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 blah. Why am I angry? Why does that need to make me angry? And then we usually start to see ideas we have, things that we're holding on to, attachments that we have, conceptions about how we think life should be, how we think people should treat us, conceptions of right and wrong, conceptions of who we are, and the world's not cooperating with my vision of reality, <laughs> which of course is reality. <laughs> it's not just my vision, it's reality. The world isn't cooperating with it. And so we get angry. But when we start to observe, we begin to see this is all due to our, you know, conceptual mind that's making up all these stories. Yeah. So it's very interesting to ask ourselves, what are my buttons that are getting pushed? What am I holding on to in this situation? You know, how can I release that? Okay. Like somebody criticizes us. Yeah. They say, you did da, 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 da. Then I have hurt feelings. I feel really bad. And I feel angry. You know, because when I'm hurt, then I get angry. Well, why, why, did, why does their criticism, you know, make me angry? Well, because they think I'm a da 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 Why does that need to make me angry? Well, maybe you are a da 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 <laughs> <laughs> So then I have to check inside, you know. Am I like that? Yeah. Well, so I look. Well, you know, I did make that mistake. Doesn't mean I'm a hopeless failure, failure worthless bottom of the pit person, but I did make that mistake. So I need to fix it up. No reason to be angry at them. No reason to be angry at myself. Let's just do something and get on with my life. Or I look and I see, oh, they're blaming me for something I didn't do. Again, why get angry? Because I didn't do it. You know, there's a misunderstanding. There's misinformation here. I can go to the person and talk to them and clear it up. Okay? So we kind of look at our own mind. Okay? That, that's one way to deal with anger. Another way that's, that's quite effective with anger is because uh, when we're angry, we're looking at the situation through this viewpoint of me. Okay, here's me. And this is how my take on reality. This is what the situation is, according to me. And we only see that. 
And it's very helpful when we're angry to tiptoe around and look at the situation from the other person's viewpoint. And if I were brought up with them in their country, in their circumstance, in their social period, in their family, if I had that kind of personality type, what would be my needs and concerns in this situation? And sometimes when we do this, when we try and like really put ourselves in the other person's shoes, we realize that really we don't understand what their needs and concerns are. And we realize, wow, I've been getting mad at this whole thing, but I don't even understand how they're seeing it. I think I need to go ask them. Or sometimes we, we tiptoe around and we really begin to see how the other person's seeing it. And then it gives us, you know, it makes us uh, able to understand where they're coming from. And that they're doing whatever they're doing because they're unhappy. And we know what that's like. Okay. So there's a whole lot of different me methods to help us broaden our perspective of the situation. Because when we're angry, we're looking at, at the world in a very, very narrow, limited way. Does that answer your question okay? Gets me well started. Okay. <laughs> I, uh -huh. I have a somewhat related question. Uh -huh. I, I read that if you're in a situation where you're upset or angry or something's pushing your buttons, uh -huh. that you should meditate on that. And uh, you talked about that a little bit about feeling it in your body, uh -huh. but if you take it beyond that, aren't you thinking? Yeah. So, you know, she she heard that if you're angry or upset, you should meditate on that. What I would say is you don't want to meditate on your anger. Well, I mean, we already have single point of concentration on our anger, don't we? <laughs> when I'm mad, I don't get distracted. <laughs> Do I? When I'm mad, my, I don't get distracted by breathing. I'm just focused on my, you know. So you don't want to really meditate on the anger. <laughs> okay. What you want to do is like, you know, one technique is just feel the anger. Be aware of it. Okay. And like, just what does this feel like in my body? So you can do that for a while. And then another thing is like, <clears throat> the things that I was saying to her, is when you you start thinking about the situation, you start checking the situation, but you're looking at it from a different viewpoint. So you are thinking, but what you're trying to do is think in a productive, realistic way. Within the meditation. Within the meditation. Okay? So maybe I'm sitting there meditating, and I start to think, okay, you know, my dear friend just, you know, they said this thing that really hurt me. What's going on in my friend's life? Well, you know, they have all these different stress factors going on right now that they may not have bothered to really articulate to me or even know of themselves. And when they're saying this and that and the other thing to me, they're basically speaking more about themselves and their own stress and unhappiness at this moment. And they're not really saying so much about me. So here's this person that's stressed and unhappy who's my friend and I care about. So maybe let's go and check up and see what's going on with them and how I can help. Yeah. Or, um, I mean, a, another classic example of parent-child con conflicts. Yeah, well, you know, when the parent looks at the situation, they see it, you know, the point of conflict as being this, and the child sees a totally different point of conflict. And they, they you know, the parent thinks that, that the, you know, when the parent says, t says to the teenager, you've got to be home by such and such an hour, the parent's concern is safety. The child's concern is autonomy. Yeah, the parent feels my kid's being an idiot. They're not listening. And the, and the kid's feeling, my parents being controlling and they don't trust me. So they're fighting about two completely different things. And neither of them are aware of what the issues and concerns of the other are. Yeah? 
And so sometimes just taking that time out to really think, you know, well, what is the issue and concern? What is the point? What is the thing going on in the life of the other person? Then you might see that it's, it's not what you thought it was. I've got a question about the pr practical aspect, at least for me. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of keeping that idea in mind of doing no harm, and then realizing that anger is playing a part in harming, and then dealing with the anger, I, you know, um, how do you go back in a practical way and undo some of the harm? Mm change that. Is that okay. part of the practice? Yeah. Okay, so when we've gotten angry and we've hurt other people, how do we go back and undo it? We can't undo the past. The past is the past, you know, but what we can do, there's two levels to go forward on. One is on our own internal level, and I think this is the first thing to go, go forward on. It's like, okay, I said or did these horrible things to somebody else. I have to own it and regret it, but not feel guilty about it. Okay, big difference between regretting it and feel guilty. Okay, what's the difference? If I regret it, I just look and I see with wisdom, I blew it. If I feel guilty, oh, what a horrible person I am. They'll never forgive me. This is terrible. No wonder everything in my life is a mess. And, you know, who's the star of the show when we're feeling guilty? <laughs> Here we are again, aren't we? Me. Yeah. So, from a Buddhist viewpoint, guilt is totally useless. <laughs> Seriously. Actually, you know, the Tibetans don't even have a word that you can translate as guilt. Like, I feel, I'm, I, I hold a lot of guilt in my heart, they don't even have a word for that. Okay? So we don't want to feel guilty, but we do want to regret what we've done. And then within Buddhism, there's a lot of purification practices, different meditations we can do in which we uh, purify this imprint made on our own mind. Okay? So I'll, I'll teach you some of these as we go on. You know, they can be simple ones in terms of um, uh, like with the breathing meditation, you imagine that you exhale all that negative feeling that made you do the harmful action, you know, you exhale that, you inhale uh, light, and imagine that the light is the nature of a, of a calm, peaceful, compassionate mind. So you can do that. There's also visualizations where we might visualize the Buddha of compassion, sending light into us and purifying the negative attitude. So I can teach you that one in the next few weeks. So we want to work first with our own internal attitudes and smooth our own mind out. And so having regret, developing compassion for whoever we harmed, making some kind of determination to be more attentive in the future, and then doing some kind of action. Yeah, either in our spiritual practice, offering community service, doing something for others. Okay. Then, on the other hand, then how do we repair it with the actual person that we've harmed? Well, that depends a lot on the situation. I mean, sometimes the person died. Sometimes they're not ready to talk to us yet. So we just, you know, we can't push it. We have to wait and be patient. The mo that's why the most important thing is inside of ourselves that we re make the reparation. Okay? Then, in terms of the relationship with the other person, I think when it's possible, you know, to go to the other person and apologize, I think that can be very good. Yeah? If, you know, if they're alive, if they want to talk to us, and to be aware, you know, that if we apologize, they may have a bunch of bottled up feelings that they need to release at that time, and so we're just going to have to sit there and listen to it. You know? But if we care about them, we'll listen to it, and they'll finish, and then we'll be able to go on and build a better relationship. But I think this thing of, of, you know, putting things in our life together is incredibly important because otherwise we carry around this psychological bag of potatoes with us for our whole life. You know, feeling lousy about things we've done. 
And so I think as much as we can do the internal purification process and let go of stuff, that much happier we're going to be now, and then, of course, the rest of our lives are going to be a lot happier. So it's time for us. Okay, one more question. One more question. <laughs> um, yeah. You gave us a, 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 a peanut butter story for, uh -huh. for, the, for the example of anger. Do you have a story that could illustrate ignorance for us? A story that can illustrate ignorance? first one that comes to mind is uh, I, I taught third grade before I became a nun. There's a little boy named Tyrone in the class who was very bright, but he thought he was stupid, and he had the self-image that said, I can't learn how to read. I don't know where he got it from, from his, you know, whatever he heard about himself, but he thought, I can't learn how to read. And sure enough, Tyrone couldn't learn how to read. But I knew that he was smart enough to learn how to read. Okay? But he had this ignorant vision of I am this solid, concrete thing. And then he... So, you know, we should look in our own lives, sometimes our own self-images and how we put ourselves in prison, how we limit our own potential by telling ourselves untrue things about ourselves and making the self into some solid, concrete thing that can't get beyond that. Okay. So let's just sit quietly for a couple of minutes before we finish this evening. <coughs> So in this closing meditation, this meditation isn't going to be on the breath, okay? In this meditation, I want you just to think about something that you heard tonight. And make an example in your life of that. And think about how you can apply what you heard to some situation in your life. said the fact that we were here this evening and we used our precious human life to think about valuable things. And then let's dedicate all that positive energy, that positive potential, send it out and dedicate it for the well-being and the happiness of each and every living being. Okay. Thank you very much. See you next week. And if people are interested in, in reading things that might fit in with the, um, what we're discussing here, we have a, a small bookshop in there. And so any of the books in there are things that, that would be good. Um, I recommend uh, Things by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Kindness, Clarity, and Insight or um, by my teacher, Zilpa Rinpoche. Well, there's one book called Transforming Problems and another one called Door to Satisfaction. Or um, either of my books, Open Heart, Clear Mind, or What Color Is Your Mind. So, because some people want to do some reading along with it. So, please feel free. Okay. <laughs>